The Lord be with you. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Today is the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. And this morning, you'll hear the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. I know that for some of you, you've heard that parable any number of times. But there are some things that I want to remind you of in the sermon. One of which is that in all of the parables of Jesus, he doesn't use a name for any of the individuals. Think of the Good Samaritan. There's no name for any of the individuals in that parable, etc., 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 the sower and the seed, and all of them, except for this one. And it's not the rich man who gets a name, it's Lazarus. And the, word, the name Lazarus means God helps me. So if you're here today wondering if God is still a part of your life or wondering where is he in my life, you've come the right Sunday to hear again that God is with you and that he helps you as he did for Lazarus. That's what we'll be thinking about um, during our service today. We don't have any birthdays or anniversaries of which we're aware this week except one, and I'll get to that in a moment. Does anybody have a birthday or anniversary? Okay, well, I want, I am so glad this was brought to my attention. So, uh, you all know Lyle Poli. Um, Lyle's mother is here this morning visiting, and this coming Wednesday she turns 99. She's older than the queen was. So, let's sing, wait, we should, can you wave? I'll ask her to wave, hello, wave. No, okay, that's okay, there she, she's sitting with Lyle and Darlene. Let's sing happy birthday to Esther. Well, happy birthday, 99, my oh my. That's a milestone. Oh wait, there's somebody else. Oh, wow. I'm sorry, where's Sylvia? Oh, I didn't even, you know what? My bad, Sylvia, I'm so sorry. I, I went from September to the first to the end of September, and I th- thought there were no birth. I'm sorry. You're nowhere near 99. I, I heard you were 29. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait, I better make sure. Are there any other birthdays? Thank you for pointing that out, Fern. Let's sing happy birthday again, but this time to Sylvia. Oh. I'm sorry, Sylvia. The board of directors is going to ensure this never happens again. Oh. Yeah, I, I've tried in meetings to encourage Fern. Never mind. <laughs> Let's stand and greet each other in the Lord's name. If you're comfortable looking at the camera, please wave to those who are watching the video as well. All right, let's join together in singing our opening
congregation may be seated. O oh Lord, give ear to my voice when I call to you. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The Lord is compassionate and rich in forgiveness. My friends in Christ, since we are assembled here to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and to receive the body and blood of Christ, let us think of our unworthiness. Confess before God that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and realize that by our own strength we cannot free ourselves from our sinful nature. Therefore, we take refuge in his infinite mercy, seeking and imploring his grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, and say, God be merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Let us then confess our sins to our gracious Lord. Almighty God, we are by nature sinful, and we have not always lived faithfully. We have turned from your ways and have not done the good you demand in our lives. We have not loved you fully or our neighbors completely. We do repent and are truly sorry for our sins in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us. Forgive, restore, and My friends in Christ, God has promised his merciful forgiveness to those who repent of their sins and turn to him trustingly. In his stead and by his command, therefore, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God keep you in his grace by the Holy Spirit, lead you in ways of faith and obedience, and finally bring you to live with him forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Please stand as we sing the, song, the hymn of praise.
The congregation may be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you are the strength of all who trust in you. And without your aid, we can do no good thing. Grant us the help of your grace that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear God's word. The Old Testament reading is from Amos chapter 6. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kalna and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great, then go to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? O you who put away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David, invent the, for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls, and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, take hold to the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich, This 
in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are good to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the, that which is truly life. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the riches, rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join together in the sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and God's peace be unto you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. 
Amen. Please be seated. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Now, of these two men, let me ask you the hard question. Which would you rather be? Maybe it's not such a hard question. The one with the really fine and nice suits? You know, the expensive cars, the servants? Of course, the Mediterranean vacations and all that fine food and fine wine. Or would you rather be the one who had to be carried because he couldn't walk? Who had to beg because he couldn't work? Whose body was covered with painful sores and whose only physicians were the dogs who licked those sores, who looked through the window at the rich man's table and longed to be a dog at his feet, lapping up the table scraps. Now, which one of these would you say was blessed by God? And be honest in your answer. Most of us would probably say the rich man. He could count his blessings It would take the fingers of both hands and his toes, but he had blessings to count. Good things, lots and lots of stuff. And the poor beggar, whose name was Lazarus, he had nothing. Blessed by God? Hardly. We might suspect that he was cursed by God that he did something to deserve this lot in life. And there, my friends, in Christ, you would be very wrong. The parable comes at the end of a chunk of teaching where Jesus wants us to loosen our grip on our money. You will recall the last two Sundays dealt with those topics. He starts with the parable of the unjust money manager, who used his money in all kinds of ways shrewdly to make friends while he still had time. Remember that? He goes on to observe that when it comes to money, the people of this age tend to be a lot smarter than the children of light, which means believers, of course, and that includes you. And then comes the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So... There's lots of things that I always wonder about when it comes to the Bible. Why of all the parables is there no one named? And why in this one is the poor man have a name, Lazarus? Why is that, do you think? So, as Jesus does in many parables, he paints this one in black and white. There's a man who's filthy rich who has a filthy beggar lying at his gate. We know the name of this man, Lazarus. It's also, coincidentally or not, I don't think so, the name of one of Jesus' best friends. Remember how that all worked out? The brother of Mary and Martha, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Remember that? We don't know the name of the rich man, nor apparently does Jesus. Or perhaps he's forgotten him with the words, depart from me, I never knew you. And then the great equalizer hits them both. They both die. The great equalizer, rich and poor alike. The rich die more comfortably perhaps, but the rich and the poor, well, they die alike. And then comes the great big surprise. The great reversal of fortunes. In death, everything gets turned upside down. The rich man loses everything. The poor man, well, he gains everything. The rich man, (coughs) pardon me. The rich man becomes the beggar. The beggar becomes the rich man. The one who was blessed is cursed. The one who was cursed is blessed. Go figure. Now Lazarus, 
who was carried every day of his miserable life to the gate of the rich man, is now carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. <clears throat> That's a great phrase in Jewish lore. The bosom of Abraham. It's a Jewish euphemism for what we usually call heaven or what Jesus calls paradise. Lazarus is in a good place, comforted, whole, happy, hanging with Abraham. The rich man is in Hades, a bad place, a place, a place of torment. The worst part of the torment is that he can see Lazarus hanging with Abraham. Just as Lazarus used to look through the rich man's window at dinner time. And the rich man, who was used to ordering servants around all his life, now tries, and do you see the twist here, to order Lazarus to please fetch him a drink because it's oh so very hot down here. At the very least, can you just please dip the end of your finger in some water to cool my parched tongue? Lazarus used to long for the crumbs. The rich man now longs for a cooling finger. The parable illustrates what Jesus spoke of earlier. Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous mammon, that is, your money, so that it will, when it fails, and when you die, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. The rich man did not do what the shrewd money manager did. He didn't invest in the mouth of Lazarus. He loved his money, he hated God. Perhaps he didn't even bother to think about God, much less trust him. Why trust God when you have everything anyway? Of course, there are no atheists in Hades. And suddenly the rich man, maybe for the very first time in his life, takes an interest in someone else and is interested in evangelism of all things. He has five brothers. They're rich too, most likely. He doesn't want them to wind up in the same way. Please send Lazarus to warn them. Now, he wants to bring Lazarus back from the dead because that's going to make an impression but would be a, a really terrible bummer for Lazarus. What does he say? They have Moses and the prophets... Let them hear them. They have the word of God written and preached. It's there for them in church waiting to be heard. That's all they need to do to avoid the fate of the rich man. That's all the rich man needed. And he had it all of his wealthy life. <clears throat> now even if someone should rise from the dead, huh, Lazarus, they would still not be convinced if they reject the word, the Moses, the prophets. Resurrections, as you know, are spectacularly impressive. But even the greatest miracle won't produce even mustard-sized faith without the word being heard. Faith, as you know, comes by hearing the word of God the word of forgiveness in Jesus' name, the word delivered in baptism and supper, the word that declares a sinner made right or justified before God solely for the sake of Jesus. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Luther said this at the end of his life, we are all beggars, this is true. My friends in Christ, I don't know what you're going through today, what heavy burden you carry <coughs> with you, or if you're even carrying a burden, but this is a word for you if you are. All of us are Lazarus. We are helpless, hopeless in our poverty, sick unto death, 
longing to even eat the crumbs that fall from God's table. Lazarus is each of us. And unless we see ourselves in him, we cannot be saved. We won't want to be saved. Unlike the rich man in the parable, Jesus comes to us right where we are in our poverty, right where we are in our most challenged times, right where we are when we don't feel God is with us or that he's helping us. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. That's a word for you, whatever you're going through today. He came to us, he came to you in the poverty of your sin and my sin and my death and yours. He came to you and me, condemned under, under the law to an eternity of mystery. He came to us when we were unable to help ourselves. He took on our weak and diseased and fallen humanity and he lifted us up from the curb and brought us to his house and washed our wounds with his baptism and gave you a seat at his table, not as a pathetic beggar, but a much-loved, beloved friend. Not as a stranger, but as one of the family. Not to eat the crumbs that fall from the table, to feast rather on the abundance of salvation that Jesus has won for you. The rich man's brother had Moses and the prophets. You have more. Now, this past week was the funeral of the queen. I don't know how much of the coverage you watched. I listened, I watched as much as I could. And I remember one commentator telling the story of a pastoral visit that she had with her Anglican priest. Now we don't, when we visit with our people, we don't tell stories. But this one he felt important to share. And he obtained the queen's permission to share it. During that visit, she and, the, well, the queen, her majesty, Queen Elizabeth II and the priest, the Anglican priest, got onto a conversation of life and faith and service. And as you all know, on the day of her coronation, that oft-quoted um, line that she used that she was going to with her whole life serve her people and that her life was one that was filled with service every day she was doing something for the people and she said to the priest you know we live our lives in faith and love and service and we go through our daily work and at the end of our lives, we go home. Now you might say, well, isn't that what a Christian is supposed to say? Absolutely it is. That's why I bring it to your attention. What a great observation. We live and serve our neighbors every day of our lives, and then we go home. She didn't say we die. She said, and then we go home. Heaven is our home. My friends in Christ, Lazarus means God helps. If God in Christ helped Lazarus, he most surely is helping you in your life, whatever it is that you face. You have more than the rich man. You have the word of God being preached to you every Sunday. You have the word of the apostles and evangelists that have been given to us for 2,000 years as we hear them 
in our ears and our faith grows. Furthermore, you have gifts, you have gifts now that far exceed what the rich man had or opportunity to have or that Lazarus has or was given opportunity to have. You have the very body of Christ and his true blood offered to you every time we have communion for the strengthening of your faith and the forgiveness of all your sins. It doesn't get any better than that, my friends. And it means that you have God's word, the assurance of the promise of his love, the strengthening of your faith, the forgiveness of sins. My friends in Christ, in other words, you're even richer than Lazarus. Amen. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in him forever. Amen. Please stand as together we make confession of our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one. The congregation may be seated as we listen to the musical offertory.
spectacular. Thank you. So in our prayers this morning, um, there are a number of people and events for whom we're praying. Um, it was brought to my attention earlier, we have a special prayer request. Pastor, in your prayers, would you please include Alvin Herman, who is the brother of Frida and Edna. Uh, yeah, he is in much pain. He's had some tests and is waiting for results. We're praying um, that God is with him and as well as with the doctors and medical staff who are being used by him to do the healing. So that's um, for Herman, the brother of Frida Wagner and Edna Rathgaber. All right. Um, we're also going to remember the people of Atlantic Canada who have been ravaged by the hurricane there. We'll include them in our prayers. And then I was able to visit with three people who are in the hospital right now. Uh, you'll recall that Irene Rudine has been worshiping with us for some months now. Um, I got a phone call from her sister, Frida Reisdorf, who I've known since I was a teenager. She was a pastor's wife in Winnipeg. And that's how I know Irene and, and, um, and Frida. We'll also be remembering Joyce uh, Mikulchuk, who is the mother of Larry. And then also we will remember Elsa Schmeling, who is the mother of Margaret Mikulchuk. So, and we'll include them in our prayers. And as I mentioned last week, we are including King Charles III in our prayers this morning as well. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O Lord, for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. And we have come to, at your bidding to plead on behalf of your people in Christ and for all people as they have need. Lord, in your mercy, Mighty God, you have made all things and given the stewardship of creation to us. Make us wise and discerning as we explore the mysteries of your creative power throughout the world you have made and keep us from abusing both the gift and the responsibility we have to you and all creation. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful Lord, you have redeemed us so that we may live new and holy lives, seeking not the desires of our hearts, but your will and command above all. Reveal to us how best to serve you and do your work here on earth and lead us to show forth our faith by doing good works that glorify your name and serve our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, you have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows even to death. Hear us on behalf of all those who suffer illness and affliction of body or mind and grant them relief, comfort and healing according to your gracious mercy. Especially do we pray for Norm Bucher, Joyce Mikulchuk, Elsa Schmeling, Irene Rudine, and Elvin. Thank you for the doctors and nurses who are looking after them and providing for their healing. Thank you for their loved ones who are standing with them in this most difficult of times. We pray for healing in their bodies, Bless also the caregivers in hospitals, nursing facilities, and homes, that they may act with compassion toward those in need of care. Lord, in your mercy, <coughs> merciful Father, you know our weakness and the violence, you know our weaknesses, and the violence, hatred, and prejudice that rules our sinful hearts. Bring to nothing the plans of all those who continue to act in the war in Ukraine or in violence against others. And preserve our nation and bring our world to peace, we pray. We pray that all those involved in the war in Ukraine 
would cease this war and that peace would come quickly. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we also bring before you all the people of Atlantic Canada who have suffered in the midst of the hurricane. We pray for them in this time of need. We we pray for those who are doing all they can now in restoring power and all the vital and essential services of our modern society. We pray that you would heal those who have been injured and provide comfort in the midst of such tragedy. Lord, in your mercy, gracious Lord, you give great blessings and none is greater than the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the salvation he won by his death and resurrection. Give to us your Holy Spirit that as we approach his table today, we may be prepared through repentance and equipped by faith to receive his flesh for the life of the world and his blood that cleanses us from all sin. Unite us as one people in faith and life here on earth until together with the saints above, we meet you face to face. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you provide for your people by your power and rule over them in love. Grant to your servant, our new king, Charles III, the spirit of wisdom and discernment that being devoted to you with his whole heart and life, he may so wisely govern that in his time we may live in safety and in peace. Lord, in your your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, knowing that you will hear the prayers of your people and answer us with your mercy, providing all things needful and beneficial to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. For in your great mercy you have come among us in Jesus, our Master and our Friend, whose death brings us forgiveness of sins, new life and the promise of endless rejoicing in your presence. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to life everlasting in your heavenly kingdom. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, We laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, congregation may be seated. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the same night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, He gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
our Father. We join together in singing the Annus Day, Lamb of God. friends in Christ, um, as we, almost, we are ready to sing the pre-distribution hymn, I just want to remind you that if you are more comfortable taking communion in the pew, then simply put your, ha- <coughs> pardon me, put your hand up and our communion distributors will bring the elements to you. And once the pre-distribution hymn is sung, we will come forward to receive communion as we have been. We join together in our pre-distribution hymn.
my friends, all things are ready. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ given for you. Please stand. Now may the true body and blood 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in joy and peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We join together in singing the closing hymn.
please be seated. So I, I want to bring to your attention some announcements this morning. Um, thank you for being with us in worship and to those who have taken the time to watch the video as well. We invite you to take some time to go through the bulletin uh, for more information about a number of things that are happening here at the church. And I want to bring to your attention a couple of special announcements. Newsletter submissions are due tomorrow to Renata um, Bishop, and the contact information is there in the bulletin. Uh, some news, the, the Joy Circle has already met, and now the Peace Circle is uh, starting up again in October. Um, there are a number of other announcements that, uh, that are in the bulletin and on the church website. Now,